Welcome to Zoom with ZOA. The name of our program tonight is The Failure of Jewish Leadership Today. It's featuring Dr. Charles Jacobs, who we'll introduce more appropriately in just a few moments. My name is Alan Jay. I'm the Acting National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at ZOA, and I'd like to welcome you all and let you know that we at ZOA hope and pray that all on this call remain safe and healthy. And on behalf of everyone here at ZOA, we wish you all gmar chatimatova and a chag sukot sameach. May we all be blessed with health and prosperity in the coming year. Since this horrific <laughs> pandemic began, ZOA has posted more than 65 Zoom programs, including webinars and book club meetings. Our webinars have featured members of the United States Congress, the Israeli Knesset, ambassadors, renowned authors, and many other influencers in the field of Zionism and Jewish advocacy. Our guests have come to us from Israel and the United States and all around the world. We do have a full schedule of upcoming events, so please watch our ZOE emails, check our website, follow us on social media, uh, and if you ever miss a program, you can go to our YouTube channel. Almost all of our programs are recorded for uh, your viewing pleasure um, at, your, at your disposal. Uh, we are going to leave microphones muted for the duration of today's program. And we will be doing a Q&A after Dr. Jacobs uh, finishes his presentation. That Q&A will be facilitated in the chat feature, the Zoom chat feature. Uh, you'll find that in the center of your screen if you're unfamiliar. Uh, and please post your questions there. We do also have questions from folks who posted them uh, through our registration page. So uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Mm -hmm. We'll be able to follow mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. <laughs> By brief way, a brief introduction for those who don't know, ZOA has been a leader in pro-Israel and pro-Jewish advocacy since 1897. Through our Center for Law and Justice and our Department of Government Relations, ZOA campus and through our regional offices around the country, ZOA shares history, facts, truth that clearly demonstrate Israel's right to be and remain a sovereign Jewish state, including Judea and Samaria in the Jordan Valley, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital, and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. At the helm of ZOA, and here tonight to introduce our esteemed guest is Mort Klein. Mort has been the national president of the Zionist Organization of America for more than 25 years and is widely regarded as one of the leading Jewish activists in the United States and I dare say in the world today. Born in a displaced persons camp in Gunzburg, Germany, Mort is the child of Holocaust survivors. Mort worked in three U.S. administrations as an economist in Washington, D.C., and he has served as a biostatistician at the UCLA School of Public Health and the Lioness Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine in Palo Alto, California, having worked very closely with two-time Nobel laureate Lioness Pauling. Mort has testified before Congress and is often quoted in the media and has appeared on many, any number of television outlets. We are blessed and honored here at ZOA to work with one of the preeminent Zionists of our time. Uh, Mort, please introduce our speaker. Well, thank you so much, Alan. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, given this Chinese virus, I call it that, it is from China. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I use my background in biostatistics and epidemiology to read the literature and uh, uh, learn more about this, uh, this Chinese virus. So if anyone wants to ask me privately about what my thoughts are about it, I have thoughts distinct from many of the things you see in the media, just like my thoughts about uh, Israel and the Jewish world are distinct from uh, many of the uh, Jewish leaders. Uh, it's really a, a, a very special uh, pleasure and honor for me to introduce Dr. Charles Jacobs, uh, who's been my dear friend for many, many decades. He's one of the wisest and most courageous thinkers in America about issues of importance to Jews in Israel. And Charles acts on his principles and insights, no matter the consequences from Jewish leaders, Jewish media, rabbis, 
who all are generally prone to appeasement of our enemies, uh, 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 and the enemies of the Jewish people in Israel, rather than confronting our enemies. In fact, only last Thursday, I haven't said this publicly, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, called me last Thursday morning to wish me a happy new year, Lashana Tova, and to thank me and ZOA for taking unconventional important stands for Israel and the Jewish people. He told me his father, Ben Sion, who was a friend of mine, who was a Jewish historian, a historian of the Jewish people. He said his father told him throughout history, Jewish leaders almost universally appeased our enemies rather than confronting our enemies. But he said there were always a handful of Jewish leaders who confronted our enemies. And that is why, according to Prime Minister Netanyahu in his phone call, is why the Jewish people have survived. And the same is true today with people like Charles Jacobs, who confronts our enemies in a direct and sincere way. Too often our mainstream leaders do not. For example, when it came to Oslo, the entire Jewish world embraced the terrorist Arafat and Oslo Zero was virtually alone in opposing it. They've uh, 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 virtually unanimously uh, embraced the Gaza withdrawal, which led to Hamas uh, uh, entity and 25,000 rockets. <laughs> so we've even seen in our own era that too many Jewish leaders do not do the right thing when it comes to protecting Jewish people and Israel. Charles Jacobs himself, after receiving a doctorate from Harvard University, uh, is the co-founder of CAMERA, a distinguished media uh, watchdog, co-founder uh, of the David Project, which helped educate high school students about how to confront lies about Israel. He's now the president of Americans for Peace and Tolerance. He has been involved in truly emancipating black slaves in the Sudan. He's flown to the Sudan, uh, helping to eman emancipate these slaves. And because of this, Coretta Scott King and Boston Mayor uh, uh, Menino gave the first Boston Freedom Award to Charles Jacobs for this extraordinary work. He's written op-eds from the New York Times to the Boston Globe to the Jerusalem Post. He's a regular columnist or a Boston Jewish advocate. Uh, really an extraordinary background in addition to being a successful businessman. Tonight, I'm so thrilled and I look forward to learning along with everyone on this call, uh, Charles Jacobs sharing with us his valuable and powerful perspective uh, of our mainstream leaders who are too frequently not doing what needs to be done to protect Jews in Israel, to protect Jewish families in America and around the world. Charles, thank you so much for being with us. Well, Mort, wow, uh, that was very kind. Thank you very much. Um, I've been thinking, Mort, you know, you and I have been at this for uh, over 30 years. Uh, and for 30 years, we've tried to do what Jewish leaders are supposed to do but did not do, that is to protect and defend the Jewish community. Um, and we know that if Jewish leaders were doing what God put them here for, you and I more would have had a more relaxed life. We've had discussions about that, but that was not to be. Uh, but you know, many blessings come with doing this work. Among them was getting to know the absolutely marvelous people, the best of our people, the fighters, and for me, that especially means Mort Klein and the folks at COA. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, so I've got about 20 minutes. Just one minor correction on your intro. I didn't uh, co-found CAMERA. I co-founded the Boston uh, branch of CAMERA, which then became the national office. This is just to make things accurate. Um, okay, so I want to make a thematic <laughs> presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to know about uh, why Arabs have black, black slaves, why Muslims have black slaves in five African countries, and what we can do about it, and how we can help free slaves and hurt Mr. Minister Farrakhan, uh, you'll invite me back for another session. If you want to know how I think uh, Jews can go on the rhetorical offense uh, instead of being defensive when Israel is attacked, you'll invite me back for another presentation. But right now, I want to do the 50,000 foot uh, look at where we are, why we are where we are, how it happened and what we need to do. So I don't need to tell everybody on this uh, call that, these, that the Jewish community in America is under ideological and physical assault, that every Jewish building and institution in America, in America needs to have security now, uh, that Jews have been murdered and assaulted in the streets, 
that Jewish buildings have been stormed with gunfire, that crimes against Jews are more than 60% of crimes against all religious targets. Crimes against Muslims, by the way, constitute only 15%. 15 uh, you can see videos of Jews beaten in the streets of New York almost every week. Jews are rapidly losing political power and influence. We've lost the support of half or more of the Democratic Party, the energetic and surging half of the Democratic Party. And that's because we've lost in many key, pre key precincts of American life, the ideological war against Israel that started in the media and on the campuses decades ago when Mort and I first met. Jewish students and the few openly Zionist professors on campus, and now even the non-Jewish conservative students are under constantly uh, social media mob attack and mob attack. In Boston, we're about to file suit against a prominent Massachusetts University whose administrative staff uh, incited students to physically attack a conservative Jewish student. Stay tuned for that. Anti-Israel curricula, which is standard fare on college campuses, is now rapidly spreading across the country in the public and private high schools. Under the guise of peace studies or conflict resolution or just history, uh, these curricula are funded by Arab and Muslim groups and the left. Uh, they, are, they are made seem to seem pedagogically correct. That is, they take the form of regular old lesson plans but they teach American youth that Israel is pretty bad among the cruelest of nations. And therefore, the lesson is that Jews here in America, right, sitting next to you in your classroom, who support Israel, and that's most of them, are people who are supporting evil things, racist things, oppressive things. And as you now know, the same curricular strategy is being used against America itself. The New York Times is helping them. So the media, the campuses, the high schools, and I haven't even mentioned, and I don't have time to mention much about the Jew hatred taught in America's mosques, which we in Boston have uncovered, uh, or the bias against Israel in the liberal churches. And so now, after years of stewing American minds and this poison from almost every cultural institution, we Jews are situated in the vortex of a perfect storm. There are four external enemies circling us. The right, the left progressives, the Islamists, and the Farrakhan-led black Jew haters. And we suspect and we know they're all coordinating their assaults on some level or another. Our situation is rapidly deteriorating. We are targeted and will, be con and will continue to be targeted by thugs who have left-wing and media cover. We cannot determine what our enemies do, but surely we should deal with the failure of our own leaders. So as these assaults mount, the major Jewish defense and communal organizations appear to be deer in the headlights, paralyzed, or worse, the best that can be said of them is that they have no strategy to defend us that makes any sense. And I'm here referring to the Jewish federations, the JCRCs, the Jewish Community Relations Councils, the American Jewish Committee, and most importantly, the biggest defense, to the Jewish Defense Agency, the Anti-Defamation League. And now we also know a lot about, because of Mort's work, the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. The leaders of these institutions have not understood or they have willfully refused to understand the nature and extent of the ideological assault against our people. And now, and we'll get to this, they're being infiltrated by and taken over by the left and they will completely betray us. They will completely betray us and they are. So how did the once powerful Jewish community collapse? How was it brought down? So we have to go back to basics. We have to go back to understand that there emerged 30 years ago a new form of anti-Semitism. Call it what you like, Palestinianism, anti-Zionism, anti-Israelism. It should not have been a surprise to us, to those of us who know about Jewish history, that a new form of Jew hatred emerges. That's the way it's always been. The Jew hatred virus morphs 
Predictably, it morphs. In each era of history, and I owe this uh, uh, way of understanding it to many people, uh, including uh, Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Sachs, uh, in each era of history, anti-Semites accuse the Jews of committing the most powerful, the most hateful sin of that time. So when religion guided society, the Jews were charged with deicide. When nationhood was seen as the way peoples expressed their virtue, Jews were cursed as stateless. When race theories were believed, the Jews were portrayed by the Nazis as racial vermin. And now, today, when nationalism is a sin and globalism is the highest virtue, the Jewish state, the Jewish, nas Jewish nationalism is the main target of Jew haters. Israel became the Jew of the nations. This should have surprised nobody. But in those times when this began, many Jews who read the New York Times misread the Times hectoring of Israel as legitimate criticism of Israel's policies. This was an enormous error. This was the error because this was not a criticism of Israel's policies. This was a full on ideological assault. So how do you know if something is anti-Semitic? Take notes, everybody. This is real simple. In the 1920s, Harvard's President Lowell wanted to restrict the number of Jews admitted to Harvard. He told his board that Jews cheat. A prominent jurist, learned, learned Hand, responded, President Lowell, Protestant students cheat too. And Lowell told him, you're changing the subject, we're talking about the Jews. That's the key. Why are we talking about the Jews? What explains the obsession with Jewish conduct compared to the relative indifference toward the conduct of others? It works like this. Why are you, Mr. New York Times, talking about Israel? So Israel has a wall you don't like, and you write about that a lot. Its enemies call it an apartheid wall, and you publish that phrase an awful lot in your paper. But you know, Mr. New York Times, there are 24 other walls and barriers and fences around the world that separate people in conflict. And you hardly ever write about that. So it's Jewish walls that matter, Mr. New York Times. Here's another trick they do. The media focus on, focuses on Palestinians who have been killed by Israelis. So much so that it's become, become a cause that pulls the heartstrings of decent people. But actually, between 1987 and 2014, about 8,500 Palestinians have been killed in confrontations with Israelis. But millions of Arabs and Muslims have been killed in conflicts that don't involve any Jews, many millions and they have been killed by Arabs and Muslims. So if you think the phrase Black Lives Matter is a new thing, understand that it was preceded by Palestinian Lives Matter, certain lives matter, right? Certain Arab lives matter, only if killed in conflict with certain people. Jews were that certain people before white cops became that certain people. So to do this trick, you have to ignore the many blacks who've been sadly killed by blacks and the millions of Arabs who've been killed by Arabs. If you're a Jewish leader and you can't recognize anti-Israelism as the new anti-Semitism, as a new form of anti-Semitism, you should leave and get another job. You cannot defend the Jews. I'm gonna tell you a key point in American Jewish history that I don't think a lot of people have identified. In 1989, Andrea Levin and I were prepared to launch a camera in Boston. It had existed, camera had existed in Washington before. We were going to form camera to fight the media bias against the Jewish state because in Boston, the Boston Globe daily bashed Israel. And we knew that this uncontested would have deleterious, harmful, results. We were about to form camera, the Boston branch, and we were approached by two very important people close to ADL. Um, one was uh, Lenny Zakem. You've heard of the Zakem Bridge. He was the ADL guy in Boston. Very good guy, actually. And the other was Steve Grossman. 
who was at one time ahead of uh, APAC and later was a treasurer of, the, of Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts. And they said, you shouldn't form camera. You should let ADL do it. Let, this was the phrase, let ADL be the ADL for Israel. I recall it vividly. Why, we asked. And they said, because if it's the ADL that told the world that the New York Times was cheating on the Jewish state, that would really matter. The ADL speaks in the name of America's Jews. And you know, they were right. And you know, we agreed. And they went to Foxman and Foxman said no. Foxman said he didn't want to take up the issue of media bias against the Jewish people, which was, as we now know, the initial ideological assault against the Jewish state. We can surmise why he didn't want to do it. Um, I think he needed his letters pub to be published in the New York Times attacking Pat Robertson uh, and doing all of the things that he was doing. I think he didn't want to upset his left-wing donors who agree with hectoring Israel to make it a better place, but he did it. And I want to tell you this, and this is my theory. The exact moment that the ADL decided not to speak in the name of the Jewish community against Jewry's biggest defamers at the time, the mainstream media, which trumpeted lies and slander daily, the minute that the ADL refused to say to the American public that the media were lying about the Jews, and that's what anti-Semitism is. They're lying about the Jews again. That minute marked, that moment marked the beginning of the decline of the American Jewish uh, fortunes, of American Jewish fortunes. That's my thesis. And it was at that moment, a vacuum was created and it became known and wonderful Jewish activists, some of the best people I have met and we have, we have seeing that the community was abandoned by its leadership, tried to fill the void by creating new organizations. They tried to stick their fingers in the dike that could, as we see today, uh, uh, in, in the dike, um, but they could not hold back the flood of Jew hatred. So then after Camera became the David Project and Stand With Us and Hasbara Fellows and many more, ZOA of course was always there, even before that, because Mort Klein is the one national Jewish leader who has no problem saying the truth about any of this, that Jewish leaders have failed the community. APAC of, their, uh, uh, APAC of course was there to defend Israel, but its mission was to lobby Congress for Israel, not to fight anti-Semitism. Defending the community was the mission of the well-funded and powerful ADL, which now, as you know, has been taken over by a former Obama consultant who has turned our Defense Department and has taken the treasury of the Jewish people to defend itself, to make it the Defense Department of the, of, of the Democratic Party, for shame. Next, so uncontested in the media, in any serious way by America's most powerful Jewish leaders, anti-Israelism moved to the campuses. In 2003, my partner Avi Goldwasser, whose films many of you have seen and should see, went with me secretly to meet with Jewish students at Columbia University who told us they were being harassed and intimidated by their professors in class whenever they challenged anti-Israel lectures or readings. We went to the ADL, nothing. We went to David Harris, who at the time, I felt was the best writer of all Jewish leaders. And he told us in his office, point blank, we don't do campuses, we do diplomacy. Well, in a generation or two, he would be having to deal with diplomats poisoned on the campuses that he didn't do. Jewish students were shocked when they came to campuses. They were totally unprepared and undefended to deal with anti-Israel arguments and anti-Israel forces, growing anti-Israel forces. Now, next to Jewish leaders, the most cowardly officials in America are college administrators. Without, without pressure from our leaders, college administrators easily bowed to the forces arrayed against us, which were many. If you look at a, for Rachel Fish does this great. If you look at a force field of all the uh, forces on each side of the issue. So here you have the professoriate, the leftist student groups, the media, 
the black and Latino radicals, the communists, the Muslim student groups, the Arab student groups, all of whom organized, well-funded, and can create pain for these administrators. And on our side, we had the small number of valiant Jewish activist groups, CAMERA, Stand With Us, ZOA, the David Project, Hasbara Fellows. Couldn't compete, couldn't give the pain to the administrators that uh, the other side could. And so, and so Jewish students were left in great part undefended by the most powerful Jewish organizations that could have defended them. Avi Goldwasser made a film called Columbia Unbecoming. We interviewed the students who described how they were being bullied. And we thought, and we even finally got the Hillel rabbi there, I forget his name now, but he was a brave guy and he was on the film. He packed up the students, couldn't find the Hillel. No. We thought the film would wake up the Jewish community. That was in 2003. It woke up a few. Now the situation is a hundred times worse for Jewish students. If it were not for the pandemic, I'm sure we'd see assaults on Jews on campuses from coast to coast. And I'm very concerned as campuses are now reconvening that they will not be protected. Next, Hamas comes to Boston to establish a base. And I mean Hamas, they set up shop. And Boston's Jewish leaders, they cowered, they ran. An Islamist group pretending to be moderate Muslims created the largest mosque on the Eastern seaboard in Roxbury, Massachusetts, on the outskirts of Boston. On their board, they had Yusuf Karadawi, who was the spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. On their board, they had Abdul Rahman Alamudi, who in 2004 was sentenced to 24 years for financing Hamas. That's who came to Boston. We did our research. We had it dead cold. We knew the facts. We went and we called a meeting of Boston's Jewish leaders, all of them in a room, and we laid it out to them. The Federation, the JCRC, the AJC, the ADL, we showed them who these people were, a direct threat to the Jews of Boston and, by the way, to the general population. You know what they told us? You need to learn to be inclusive, to support diversity, encourage interfaith dialogue. That's what we're going to do. We're gonna have interfaith dialogue with these people. And you know, the dialogue guy from the Muslims was caught by us, no, by somebody else, uh, writing that uh, Jews were sons of monkeys and pigs, Jews were terrible. That's the head, that's the dialogue guy from the, from the Muslim, uh, the Islamic Society of Boston Cultural Center. So the head of Boston's Federation, which is called the Combined Jewish Philanthropies, CJP, is named Barry Schrake. I know Barry for a long time. Barry came to my house to watch on my computer the speeches of Yusuf Karadawi, calling for the death of all the world's Jews, and who is now likely to be one of the guy, a main guide of Boston's Muslims, which by the Boston Muslim population had been relatively moderate to that time. I showed him how Alamudi was an operative. I showed him how the same guy reaching out to the Jews for their support had written hate screeds in the Arabic papers. I showed him how all of the other board members uh, had been tied to terror or hatred. We showed them checks that went from the Islamic Society of Boston to terrorist organizations and back and forth. And you know what he told me? Barry said to me, the head of Boston Jewry said to me, Charles, you want me to fight a Jewish jihad? I said, no, Barry, go to the mayor who we supported all this time. Tell him not to let these folks have a major institution in the hub. Tell him not to subsidize the purchase of land for the mosque, which he did. The mayor actually gave the mosque land for practic public land for practically nothing. What did we get from Barry and the rest of them? From every one of those Jewish institutions? Nothing. Moral confusion, delusion, cowardice. And now we found the curriculum taught in that mosque. I have an incredible research guy, Ilya Feyaktistov, who wrote a book about all this. He found, he can find anything. He found their curriculum. It's the Muslim version of Nazi hatred. And now 
years later, we know there are 14 people connected with that mosque who've either been killed, who are on the run from federal authorities or who are in jail. The Boston Marathon bombers were congregants of that mosque. We have been hectoring Boston's Jewish failed leaders and pleading with them for years to stop giving Islamists a kosher stamp, which is the Islamist key to the city. Imagine a, a non-Jewish person in Boston, he hears the Jewish organization saying, well, these guys are okay, that's, that's okay. Well, he says to himself, rightly, this non-Jewish person says, well, the Jews have more skin in the game than anybody else. And if they vetted these people and if they're, if they're okay, then I gotta be okay with them. So the, the, the decision by the Boston Jewish leaders to not tell other groups in the city, other religious and political groups in the city, to not tell the media what they knew, what they knew about who was funding and running this mosque is a terrible sin, is a terrible sin. Finally, after we mocked and humiliated Boston's liberal leaders, and actually we made a film um, about a rabbi, and we named him, we had him in the film. This rabbi allowed radical Muslims to come to his congregation and raise funds from Jews, right? So this money, these are groups connected to care, which is Hamas. So Jewish, he's letting Jewish money go in his synagogue, eventually could kill Jews. Um, finally, after so much hectoring, and we kept at it and kept at it. Uh, and they attacked us at every point. They had rabbis, for mostly reform and some conservative, sign a letter against me, uh, defamed me in, in the papers. It's terrible. It's, I cannot get a platform in, uh, in many, many, many synagogues because of the uh, united efforts by all the establishment Jewish organizations to, to stop me from saying what I know. Uh, now the, a, the JCRC and the ADL have, with, have withdrawn uh, their support, their public embrace from that mosque. But they didn't do it publicly, they just quietly stopped supporting them. They didn't say, guess what we found out, folks? They didn't do the most important thing they could do, which is to educate the community. Okay, so you should all know this story. Uh, Ilya's book is called Terror in the Cradle of Liberty. Uh, it names names like I have and even more. Uh, it's at Amazon. Go buy that book if you want to know about uh, the failure of Jewish leaders. Finally, in the public schools. So the left and the Muslim organizations have learned to insert pedagogically correct anti-Israel curricula. Uh, so guess what they did here? Our Jewish leaders. So the leader of uh, the Newton Public School Board, was terrible. We went to him, we showed him all the materials that you all know this, the Arab World Studies notebook and worse, terrible stuff. Uh, we showed it to him, wouldn't talk to us, wouldn't talk to us. So we took out an ad, a full page ad in the Boston Herald. We had his picture there and his name. Call him up if you don't like these things from these books, right? Turns out that he was married to the cousin of the head of the Jewish Federation. And they went berserk. They accused us of putting a target on his back and you know we were being nasty and we just told people, you know, petition of grievance, call them up. Uh, and they told the mayor of Newton, Massachusetts, this is the JCRC and the Federations and the AJC and the ADL, the four horsemen of whatever. They went and they told the officials of Newton, Massachusetts, there's no problem, or it's a little problem. Don't worry about it. How could we win? We had the grassroots of, we had the Jewish, uh, the Russian Jewish community behind us. They're amazing. We had Margot Einstein, the 97 year old, I don't know, she's the uh, spirit of Zionism in New England. We had so many people on their side, but as long as the mayor could say to me, and she did, well, but the JCRC says that you're, you're wrong. It's not, it's not what you say. How could we possibly win? So 
this has been going on for nine years. And the only way that it can ever be concluded successfully for us is if there's new Jewish leadership or if there's a lawsuit. Stay tuned. So apart from the ZOA, we are practically the only group that feels it's a moral imperative to tell the Jews and the general public about the failure of our community's leadership. Just take the issue of Hyas, for example, which Mort does very well. I did research on what people who come from Syria have learned in Syrian schools. Syrians only have one kind of school. Uh, it's a government run school. It's one kind of curriculum. You can't go to any other kind of school in Syria. And what you learn from the Syrian curriculum is that Jews are very, very bad. All the things you could ever imagine, right? So, you know, you can't get into an American college English class without getting sensitivity training first. But Hyas is going to import millions of people from the world's most anti-Semitic regions, according to the ADL itself, as Mort has pointed out to Congress, without vetting them. And if you beg Hyas, if you say to them, at least ask them what they think of Jews and women and blacks and democracy and Sharia, they won't do it. That would be racist to ask them that question, right? So here we have a group that pretends to be Jewish that is importing into this country people who will hate us, who already hate us, and may do us harm and hate America. Um, and now Hyas got one of its senior officials to be the head of the incoming head of the Conference of Presidents, which Mort is valiantly and has valiantly fought. We don't need American non-Jews to say to themselves, why is it that the Jews are in the forefront of bringing in all these people from that part of the world that don't particularly like America? What, you know, I, I read neo-Nazi literature at night so I can go to sleep. <laughs> They've got it, they have it down. They say, who is it who is ruining Europe? It's the Jews, how are they doing it? They're in the forefront of bringing in these people from the Middle East. And they quote Jewish rabbis who say, it's, you know, we were refugees there, we have to do it, we have to do it, we have to do it. Why are the Jews doing this? Revenge for the Holocaust. I say to myself, if only. But that's, I mean, there, there is a certain reality there that you're not allowed to say. And, and only a very few of us are willing to say it, and we have to say it louder and louder and louder. And I think there should be a national campaign against Hyas and against importing people without vetting their ideas. Anyway, so I, I think, uh, and I think, I think I've come to an end because I wanted to just paint a picture of, of where we are. And uh, I'll leave for the Q&A the topics of why do Jewish leaders act the way they do? And uh, Lenin's question, what, what is to be done? Thank you very much. That's it, Charles. Thank you so much for that very clear, um, concise evaluation of our situation today. Uh, we will begin Q&A, but I'd like to start with Mort. I'm sure Mort has a question or two. And Mort, it's all yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Charles. I, I wish to God you would be uh, the incoming chairman of the Conference of Presidents. <clears throat> that would be uh, good for everyone, except for the, and the enemies of the Jews wouldn't be good for them. <laughs> I wanted to mention, uh, I went to Abe Foxman <clears throat> uh, 30 years ago and showed him that the textbooks, American history textbooks condemn Israel falsely, uh, travel guides condemn Israel falsely, universities do, and I showed him the proof. I asked him, if he would do something about it, he showed no interest. I talked to him directly. I was not involved in ZOA then, he showed no interest. So why does a guy like that show no interest in that? Why is it when we started the Oslo agreements and ZOA was alone in pointing out that they're violating every aspect of Oslo. They're not getting rid of the covenant. They're promoting hatred and violence. They're murdering Jews. They're not arresting uh, murderers. <laughs> why is it that the Jewish community, and I was begging one Jewish leader after another, speak out about the violations, demand the they fulfill their obligation under Oslo. They wouldn't do it. Condemn incitement by the Arabs. They wouldn't do it. 
Uh, I, I, I beg them to condemn uh, Rashida Tlaib and uh, Ilan Omar, these anti-Semitic uh, members of Congress. <laughs> they won't do it. I beg them to condemn Biden <clears throat> for allowing <clears throat> the anti-Semite Linda Sarsour and AOC to speak at, at his uh, nominating conference. <laughs> they won't do it. <laughs> uh, uh, and yet, when I speak out against Black Lives Matter's platform, calling Israel a genocidal apartheid state, supporting BDS, not saying one word and, and, and supporting racial equality and racial, and racial rights, black rights, 16 Jewish organizations, the leaders of the reform movement, the conservative movement, uh, Hayas, Amenu, all the Jewish women's movements condemn me as a racist for simply exposing the platform of the Black Lives Matter group as being anti-Semitic, which is what it was. So why don't they say one word against the people who are hurting our people, as I mentioned, and yet they attack someone like me who's simply exposing an organization that's anti-Semitic? What is going on in their minds? What's going on in their heads? To this day, I don't quite understand it. Okay. What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> okay, so you need Freud, right? Uh, this is not Marx, this is Freud. So before I, before I answer that question, I want to point out that the picture you just painted is that there's a civil war in the Jewish community, but only one side, aside from you, only one side is really fighting. We're not fighting back, except for you, right? There are many Jews who are Zionists and wonderful Zionists who don't like the fact that uh, we have attacked Jewish leaders, because they say, you know, that's sinat hinam, or that uh, Jews shouldn't fight other Jews, washing dirty laundry in public, we're a small besieged minority, how can we fight, you know, no, no, no. Well, we gotta stop that, because they're fighting us, and they're gonna win unless we fight back. Why do they believe what they believe? Well, in the beginning, you know, Foxman had a cushy job. <laughs> how easy is it to fight the right, to fight neo-Nazis? Who inside the big tent is going to be angry at you if you fight the neo-Nazis? Who in the whole world is going to be angry at you if you fight the Nazis? Cushy job, Abe. Lots of perks, lots of money. You're a hero. But what happens when uh, the, the Jewish world is confused and divided about Israel, is utopianist, has allowed itself to be um, lured into utopian thinking, and that every, you know, there's a, anti-Israelism in America is a derivative of postmodernism. I'm gonna say it again. Anti-Israel in America is a derivative of postmodernism. They don't hate us because we kill baby Jesus. They hate us because we have the Zionist state. Why, what is postmodernism? It's something that every student in every class in a public school in America is learning. Okay, all people are the same, all cultures are equal, all narratives are equally valid. The only problem of conflict is that uh, is mis conflict is caused by misunderstanding and miscommunication. Uh, poorer people have a higher moral claim. Uh, darker skinned people have a higher moral claim, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what being, and anti-Israelism comes right out of that. It falls out of that. So if you never heard of anything else, and if those were the principles that, that were stuck in your head, you would, you would be anti-Israel. Abe Foxman had a cushy job. He didn't know about left-wing anti-Semitism. He certainly knew nothing about Islam. When he came to Boston and he talked, somebody asked him a question about Islam, it was like you were asking a, a kindergarten person. Um, and, he, and he didn't want to fight. Why should he fight? Why should, he tell the New Why should he tell the Jews the truth that the New York Times is committing anti-Semitism by lying about the Jews every day? Well, that would upset half his donors or some of his donors. And he wouldn't get his, he wouldn't get his letters published anymore. Why are these Jews now acting the way you've described that they're acting in every one of the cases that you said? Because they're more liberals than Jews. They're, they're, they, they have abandoned us. They have a different religion. It's wokeism. It's secular liberalism. Or it's tikkun, I call them tikkunistas. It's tikkun olam. They've hijacked our religion. Tikkun olam has been twisted 
to mean that Judaism is socialism. This is a big fat lie. So these people are um, betrayers. You know, it's hard to be a Jew. There are always Jews who left. Sometimes they left uh, to become Christians. Sometimes they left to become Muslims. Now they li leave to become globalist wokists. And you know, they're better than you and me, Mort, because they care about the whole world. We just care about this little people. You know, they're, they're better than us. And it's a way for them to escape and they're cowards. That, I mean, that's, that's the reason. And we have to oust them from their positions. We have to fight them in public. That's my answer. Let's go. Alan, let's go to the first question. So Charles, you, um, you paint the picture and you identify um, the why, you know, why the, the rabbis and why the Jews are, are um, focusing more on Tikkun Olam and less on Israel and Jewish people. What do we do about it, Charles? What's, what's, the, what's the what do we do, uh, you know, short of supporting organizations like, like ZOA, defending more? And I know that obviously people on this call do that. But what would the strategy be that you would recommend? Look, um, I talked to Melanie Phillips and Caroline Glick about this. And um, they said that, you know, there's a million to a million and a half Jews in America who think like we do, but they're unorganized. And wh what they meant was not, th they, they belong to ZOA, to camera, to, to, to many, many things. But there's no we on our side. There's no we to rise up and say to the press, you know, there's another Jewish voice that's not being represented by the establishment Jewish organizations. So I think, and it's very hard, I've been working on this for a year, it is very hard to do. I think there needs to be a coalition in the center right that, that confronts and, and tells the world that no, Jews don't want to import millions and millions of people from a region that, uh, uh, that teaches their children to hate Jews, America, democracy, gays, you know? Um, we don't want to do that. We are not the people who want to defund the police. We are not the people who want to do these crazy things. We are Americans and we are uh, Democrats, uh, small d. And we're classic liberals. We need to be able to, I think, create an umbrella that does that. That's that, and it's very difficult to do. Fair. Uh, Charles, you recently took out uh, an ad in the Boston Jewish Advocate defending the ZOA and Mort Klein against your own JCRC's attempt. There it is. Yeah. Can you explain to us uh, what's going on in Boston and why? Yeah. So this horrific JCRC in Boston, the one that embraced the mosque, the one that told the Newton school officials that uh, the curriculum was just hunky-dory. Um, that, that one uh, is, is responding to Mort Klein. Well, it's like cancel culture coming to the Jewish community, right? They want to evict the ZOA from their so-called big tent. They want to evict the ZOA and they accuse Mort of racism because Mort said the simple truth that the leaders of the Black Lives Matter organization are anti-Semitic. They are. Doesn't mean that we don't think Black lives don't matter. Who would want to live in a country where Black lives don't matter? We know Black lives matter. But the problem is the people who run that organization are anti-Semitic and anti-American and Marxist. And Mort said the truth. And that gave them the uh, excuse to label him as a racist. They are shameful. And we put their picture up here next to Mort. And we said, oh, here's a, listen, we sent, I think Mort, you're going to send this around. I hope you do. Yes, next week. Okay. We uh, sent this around. I want to get hundreds of people to sign on to this ad. And so far, we've we're, we're got about 100 who are willing to sign on to this ad. I want to get thousands of people to sign on to this ad because we have to, at some point, gather all of our forces and show strength and power. And, uh, and that's what I think. So 
I mean, God bless you, Mort, for saying the truth, and God damn them for, for just lying about you. Well, we, we appreciate your support, Charles. You know, um, the DOA walks around and we do our work feeling kind of isolated. Uh, so it's uh, heartwarming to us and very helpful to the cause that there is Charles Jacobs and those like you. We continue to do our work. But there, there are a few questions here that are thematic around the streams of Judaism. So I'm going to aggregate them into a question. You brought up tikkun olam and that it seems to be a focus. Um, and a lot of the comments in the chat that we're kind of monitoring during this program indicate that you know rabbis are taking their congregations to various uh, marches and organizations that don't align with uh, theologies that are Jew Jewish cause centric. Now you identified that, that there's a reason, but what do we do about that? How do we train our fellow Jews to support Israel? Why is the leadership not doing that? Because the leadership of those, uh, many of them are reform and some are conservative, um, have left Judaism really, and have twisted Judaism into uh, tikkun olam. Let's call them tikkunistas. I think there needs to be a public relations campaign explaining, you know, I forget the name of the book, but you'll, somebody here will know it. Somebody who just wrote a great scholarly uh, expose of how they twisted uh, the words of the Bible, uh, how they twisted holy Jewish words to mean something that it doesn't mean at all. And, uh, and I think that we should explain that to people and explain that to the Jews. And if that means a fight, and you know, this is what you know, the Orthodox rabbis don't want to have this fight. I have a, I, you know, I, I have harsh, hard discussions with Orthodox rabbis. Why don't you tell all the Jews that they're being misled by these rabbis who are, you know, they don't want to do that. We have to do that. So I think we should explain it to people. And I, I'll send you the name. Somebody should come up with the name of that book. I forgot it. But it was, it's really good. It explained Tikkun Olam never meant what they say it means. Right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw one more at you, but it gives me an opportunity, candidly, to do a little bit of a home job. One of the questions that we received prior to the program was, um, how do we develop solid leadership? Two, two parts. How do Jewish people, how do the Jewish organizations hold our leaders accountable? And how do we train young Jewish leaders to be viable Jewish leaders? And with that, I can say that if anybody in the audience would like information, we have a ZOA program that we're promoting now with, um, with, that we're developing with the Young Leadership Initiative uh, for young professionals. Uh, one of my colleagues will put my email address into the chat. If anybody has questions about our Young Professional Initiative, please do contact me. I'll put you in touch with the people that are running that campaign. So Charles, um, how do we teach young Jews? First of all, how do we hold the Jewish leadership accountable? And how do we train young Jewish leadership to focus on the right issues, and that will be my last question. So I think that uh, when I was head of the David Project uh, with Avi Goldwasser, uh, we developed a curriculum that was in over 100 uh, American and Canadian schools. It was a uh, like a 10 module curriculum that we, uh, it was difficult to get into Orthodox Jewish schools because they said, well, what are we gonna do? We got a Talmud class, we have a Mishnah class. Right? So but we got it in. And it was good for years and years. And then, um, long story short, I left the David Project for internal uh, squabbles. And uh, the David Project went uh, soft. And it, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I just heard today that the head philanthropist that funded the David Project to the tune of millions of dollars a year, his name is Seth Klarman. I just read an article that he's spending billions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars funding the Democratic Party. So uh, anyway, um, so what we do need to, to, is to form, and this is what we had, I think we should do it again. And I, I would help you if you want to do it. Um, we should go back into the Jewish day schools and form an army that continually understands how to make Israel's case on campus and how to fight back. And then we'll, we'll, we should do it. Um, that's what I think. Thank you. Mort, before I ask Charles if he has any final questions, do you have anything you'd like to say before we close? <laughs> uh, well, yes, I wanted to say that 
even beyond the politics, even beyond appeasing our enemies, as you've discussed. <laughs> when I wrote an article complaining about interfaith marriage, Jews marrying non-Jews, saying this is harming Jewish continuity, that this is harming especially the conservative reform movements, which are slowly dissipating and, and becoming smaller and weaker, and it's harming support for Israel and America, interfaith marriage. David Harris of the American Jewish Committee put out a statement saying, my condemning interfaith marriage is deeply offensive and divisive and stop. Why on earth would David Harris and AJ Committee condemn even an appeal for Jews to marry Jews? Well, uh, you know. and with that, Charles, do you have do you have some closing comments? Sure. Look, everybody, we're in a very, very difficult position. We have to fight like we've never fought before. Increase our uh, resilience and 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 determination. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm very worried about the future, and I want to you know bless all of the good people that we have in the country. And I do think we need to form a national coalition that expresses itself as, as opposed to the failed, betraying establishment Jewish community. Charles, before I thank you, I just ask my colleagues to put up in the chat our upcoming events. Please read them. Also, Charles, we'll put a link to your website so if people want to get in touch with you, they have the ability to do that. Um, I, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I thank you on behalf of ZOA, knowing that we have people like you at our side as we fight the battles that we fight, as we advocate for Israel without shame, or without any kind of uh, fear. It's good to know that you have our back and we have your back and we'll continue to do that for one another. I hope you'll join us again. You and I have spoken before today. I know there are a couple of other topics that we can bring you back to discuss. And I hope that you'll honor us with your expertise. Mm -hmm. To those of us who are on the call with us, I hope you enjoyed the program. Uh, if you did and you know the hard work that we're doing, please consider to give us your financial support. My colleagues will list uh, our donation page in the chat. You can go to our website, sign up for our newsletter if you're not receiving it at this time. We do need your help. This is a very serious fight, as, as Charles pointed out. Uh, there are a few of us in this space that really have a voice. Uh, the ZOA and Mort Klein and Dr. Jacobs are, are one of those or some of those few voices. Please support us. I wish everybody for, on behalf of ZOA, Gemar Hatima Tova, Chag Sukkot Sameach, and Shabbat Shalom. This ends the program. We hope to see you in future programs. Shana Tova. Thank you, everyone.